30 I'm going to wait for the 30 second sync uh, for Mary to tell me just to make sure that it's broadcasting and then I'll start with the questions. Uh, if anyone is out there watching live, hi. Uh, if you're watching not live, hi. Have I waited long enough yet? Probably. I am not oh, okay. yet. Ah, okay. Well, then I'm just going to get started. Uh, so, welcome to the second monthly Patreon podcast for the uh, $10 and up group. Uh, I have a couple of questions today from Aiden Price. Uh, the first one is, hey Mike, do you have any advice for getting player feedback about your game? Is there a particular method you've found effective or certain questions that you like to ask players? Uh, so let's see, I mean, there's generally three ways that, uh, that you talk to players, right? You do some sort of user testing where you, you, you give them the game, you hand them the controller, and then you say play, and you just watch them play, right? And occasionally you may ask them questions like, can you tell me why you, you did that? Or what, what do you think the game's telling you to do, right? So you're asking these sort of high-level, non-prompting questions to see if they understand the questions that your game is asking them. And then by watching them and seeing you know, what, they're, what they're doing, you can then figure out what, what, their, what, their, uh, what their issues actually are, right? Uh, what isn't very useful in user testing is asking them what they want or what they think is wrong or anything like that because uh, often they won't have the training necessarily to know why they don't like something from your game. So uh, the uh, so with user testing, you can reliably get you know good feedback, but you can't get it necessarily by asking. But there's a couple other ways that developers often receive feedback, which is you know, comments, forums, email, or uh, word of mouth, that sort of thing, right? Um, and with those, it's a lot harder to pull out what uh, what the nugget of gold that you can you can take from their feedback is. So, uh, you know, for example, uh, people may really hate a certain feature of the game, and that's really useful to know that people hate it, right? But what's not that useful is the reasons that they're telling you that they hate it. Because uh, often in games, there's so much going on and so much of it is behind the scenes that you can't really count on someone who doesn't know about those things to, to tell you that, right? So again, what you need to do is try to get the objective information and then try to figure out from that what you can do with it. So uh, the important thing really is that you, you want to get to the grain of what it is that players are, are, are looking for in your game. Like, uh, you, you don't want what they think they're looking for. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, we, you know, whenever we run a user test for any game, right, uh, we get in a whole bunch of people who've played Call of Duty because everybody's played Call of Duty for you know, every user test, no matter who's, what company it is. And so when we ask them, what can we do to make this game better, regardless of whether it's Call of Duty, they start saying, oh, make it like Call of Duty, right? Uh, Mark Cerny used to say that if you want to know what was hot 10 seconds ago or 10 minutes ago, you can ask players. But if you want to know what's going to be good by the time you ship the game, right? You're not going to be able to get useful information from your players about that. So I guess what I'm trying to say is you want to, especially when you're communicating with players and taking feedback, you want to make sure that you're taking the right pieces of feedback and that you're doing the right things about those pieces of feedback. Um, one, of the, one of the things I do in user testing, if I notice they're not getting something and I'm not sure why, right? So I'm watching them play. They're clearly not understanding it because they've been in, a, say, a puzzle for 45 minutes and I only wanted it to take five minutes, right? So I've let them fail. I've let them try to figure out how to do it. They still can't. So I'll go up to them and I will have this, at this point, I'll thought of a fix, right? So let's say they don't know what to do because they haven't been properly trained on it. So I'll come up and I'll say, okay, imagine that at some point a box pops up on the screen and it says, press Z to do this. Right? And then I'll back off. I won't tell them anything else and then watch them and see if they, if that gives them enough information to figure it out. Right. So 
you can use the user testing as an opportunity to ask those questions. You know, imagine the game told you this. What would you do? Uh, when it comes to the comments, word of mouth stuff, you have to be uh, you have to be careful in the same way, right? So, if you actually have a if you're having a dialogue with someone, you can say, "Oh, okay, tell me what is it you think that the game was trying to ask you to do," you know, or what what is it that like why why did you decide to do the thing, right? Uh, just try to figure out what it is that they're not getting that you intended them to get before you tell them how to solve the puzzle or tell them or, or, or tell them you know uh, uh, what was wrong or tell them or, or, or accept you know their so potential solution to the puzzle you need to understand sort of what they're building all of that off of so the, the important questions to ask will always it'll always be based on the feature that you're testing but uh, you want to get inside the why of what they're doing so that's always that's always paramount right and then try to as much as possible distance yourself from the suggestions of how to fix it until you're sure you know what's wrong then by all means look at what the suggestions are because they might be accurate right there's a chance uh, just don't go there first is what I'm saying um, you don't really want to solve it with an opinion you want to solve it with uh, an identification of the problem and a solution that fits that specific problem. So then the, the second part of Aiden's question was, uh, I was wondering what methods do you normally use to communicate a design with the programmer or your team? Uh, so let's see, historically, right, the ways you're going to be communicating with people, you might send them a document, you might call them up on the phone or, or text chat or something like that. You might walk over to their desk and talk to them in person, or uh, or probably worst case, right, you're gonna have a meeting. Uh, and each of those has good things and bad things about it, right? Like if you're, if you're doing a document, people don't like to read documents, so any document over, say, three pages is probably too long uh, and probably won't get read and probably won't serve your purpose. Right, so documentation is probably more useful as an executive summary, or if you can make it very visual, people can connect with that, right? But it needs to be short because people have work to do. They can't just sit there and read your document all day, right? At the point where it becomes complex enough that you need to communicate that much information, communicate the basics of it on paper, and then move on to the next step, right? Having a chat or going over to their desk and talking about them. Uh, if you're dealing with it in email or text, only deal with the simplest problems that way because i found that you just it's it's like pulling teeth to get people to read for some reason right so the the more simple and direct and respectful of their time you can make your documentation the more likely it is that there will be some positive benefit from it then you take the more complex stuff and deal with that in person right or as a prototype or in some other way that communicates the information uh, experientially. Uh, I remember hearing somewhere that in the in the Myers-Briggs topology, which is a personality uh, a personality test sort of thing that that gets your uh, uh, how you communicate with other people. Uh, they they divide people into two groups. Uh, I think it's sensate and intuitive. And about eighty percent of all people are sensate and about 20% are intuitives. Sensate people come to their world through experience, and intuitives come to their world through ideas, right? They, they come to understand things that way. A lot of designers tend to be intuitives, right? So we, we communicate very well and understand very well uh, abstract ideas that can be on paper. You know, we we live in the world of the abstract because we're that's part of the reason why we like designing games we like playing around with those things but most of the people we're communicating with don't come to reality that way they don't come to understand things that way uh, they need to experience it more than they need to read the ideas about it right and so at that point the the way to communicate it is in person right you go go over to their desk and you just have a chat 
and they ask you all the questions that they need to ask and you answer them all and uh, and usually in that process you're uh, you know you're you're both getting clarity on the feature and then t tightening the pieces of the feature uh, because usually a first draft of any feature is going to be at least a little wrong and so in hashing it out with your programmer or whichever teammate is working on it with you uh, you can you can refine it before it gets implemented and you have to uh, and it gets very expensive to change things so uh, and then meetings meetings are a last resort if you need to communicate something to a lot of people at once a meeting can work uh, if you need to get brainstorm a lot of ideas a meeting can work if it's very focused uh, you know if you have someone writing notes and someone making sure that it's only gonna last for you know 45 minutes to an hour and no longer uh, meetings can be really helpful but they have to be really structured to not completely get off course and be useless and waste everybody's time uh, so uh, that talking about how to make a, a, a structured meeting would be an entirely different thing uh, maybe I can get a producer friend of mine to talk about that on the podcast uh, but it's uh, it what it comes down you've all probably been in meetings like this right where you're, you're sitting down there's no structure people just keep coming up with ideas everything keeps going around in circles and by the time the meetings over you haven't actually accomplished anything uh, and in brief, the way I've seen to solve that is uh, you make sure that there's an agenda for the meeting, that you know what you're going to do, what problems you're trying to solve, and that'll keep you on track. You know, Or you make sure you have someone in the meeting who's willing to keep everybody on that track, whatever the agenda was. And anything else that you find out during the meeting that needs to be discussed, talk about it somewhere else. Don't talk about it during that meeting. Right? That'll keep it focused and respectful of everybody's time, and it will likely yield the reward uh, not rewards the results that you were looking for in the first place by having the meeting that you won't get necessarily by some sort of free form uh, 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 you know just a, a opinion session right uh, the so the everything gets a little trickier when you're trying to communicate something to a teammate who's not into it right let's say you have an idea for a feature and you communicate it to your teammate and the teammate wants to do it a different way right that's very common it's probably most of the time you're going to get something like that uh, most designers at that point you know either dig their heels in and say no we're not changing anything or they give it up completely and just do it however the other person wants I'm going to go ahead and say both ways are overreacting incorrectly, right? They're, you're going too far left or right on either uh, e with either of those approaches. Um, what you're what you what you try to do at that point, right? I always I so let's say I'm in a meeting or I'm talking to someone and they're like, you know, I just don't think that's going to be fun. I mean, when I play things like that, I don't like them, right? Now you have to accept what they're saying is the truth because for them that's true right when they play those things they don't like them and it might it might not be that what you're intending will, will will strike your your teammate that way right there might be things in your design that will keep that from happening but you do have to accept the fact that, that person has had a bad experience and doesn't want to create something like that right now when you're not working on a game by yourself when you're working on a game with teammates you're the the feature that you're working on is just as much theirs as it is yours and your goals are the same you want it to be awesome right and anytime one of your teammates feels invested in a feature when they have skin in the game right that feature is going to come out better than the feature that they don't want to do so immediately when I hear I don't want to do that I hear okay as written this will not come out very well, right? Unless I can, uh, uh, unless you know, we we talk around it and come back to this, right? But right now, if I say just do it, it's probably not going to work, right? That's that's been my experience. 
So what I do at this point is for every design that I make, I always know what the most important thing is about that design. What, it, what role in the game design it's filling, right? And if it's missing, what the game will be lacking for that, right? I'm not as attached to my specific solution to the problem as I am to the fact that we need a solution to that problem or the game won't work, right? So uh, the from there, right, you have a couple options. You can say, yeah, let's do it your way. You can say, no, we're going to do it my way because the game won't work without it. Or you can say, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it your way. And let's try to solve the same problem I was trying to solve with my idea, right? And then you then you have you have a dialogue instead of a a wall, right? You haven't created opposition. You've created discussion, right? And uh, you're not trying to create compromise. You're trying to achieve the same goal, right? Uh, and there's a million different ways to solve any problem. My way isn't necessarily going to be better than your way, especially if you're the one making it because you're not going to be as excited about my way as I am. You're going to be more excited about your way. So saying yes and in those cases solves two problems, right? It solves the initial resistance that you create by saying no. And it solves giving away too much, right? By saying, yes, let's just whatever. We'll do it your way. And if it doesn't work out, I guess that's your fault or whatever, you know, some way that that ends up just being a complete relinquishing of responsibility. Uh, and when, when I approach it that way, people are very reasonable. Uh, it's, it's only when people are angry or stressed or afraid that they get really unreasonable. So if you don't give them a reason to do that, they will, they'll, you know, you can say, okay, the reason I wanted to do the feature this way was to solve problems A, B, and C. Can we agree that those are problems that need to be solved? And most of the time, yeah, because they don't want those problems just as much as you do, right? And so at that point, you can start thinking, uh, all right, how can we solve the problem, uh, the problems I'm trying to solve and the problems my, my teammates trying to solve by, uh, by then having a discussion and hashing it out? A lot of times, uh, you'll come up with something new and better than what you had in the first place. Uh, occasionally, you'll say, okay, uh, what you're suggesting accomplishes all my goals, so let's just do that. And then sometimes you'll circle all the way back around to the point where the other person says, you know what, the way you were suggesting it was the right way to do it, let's do it. And now that person is on board. It's become their idea to a certain extent. And I have more confidence that they will be able to execute it because they have skin in the game, right? Um, let's see. Uh, when, I was, when I was first starting in design, I had this fear that if I designed a feature, right, I was responsible for the feature, because you are, but if that feature failed, I was afraid that I wouldn't be given an opportunity to do it again. I thought, uh, you know, I'm I'm just a fraud. I've never designed anything before. I don't know what I'm doing, right? I have all this going around in my head. I talk to the my teammate, and the teammate says, I don't like the idea. And what I hear is, I don't think, you know, you know what you're doing, <laughs> right? That's what I heard when I was when I was younger. Um, or or you hear them suggest something and you think, oh God that's not at all the problem I need to solve in order for this to be good, right? And if, if it's bad, I'm never going to be able to do it again. They're going to fire me and I'll never get another job or something like that. You start getting really, um, uh, not paranoid, but uh, slippery slopish. You start thinking ahead to the worst case scenarios, you know. And then once you're afraid, right, you start getting upset, you start getting angry, you start getting, right, now the other person's going to sense that in you and they're going to start getting afraid or they're going to start getting angry or they're going to start getting stressed, right? And all of a sudden, there's no communication. You can't do that anymore. Uh, 
sometimes that still happens to me, right? I come into a situation and somehow, even though I am trying not to, my ego or the other person's ego become the stakes in our conversation, right? There's a winner as opposed to a solution, right? When that happens, I've learned to recognize that it's happening. And then what I do is I say, okay, let me go back and think about that for a while. And then we'll meet again and we can talk about it, right? Because in that moment, I know I'm not going to be able to be rational. I'm only going to make the problem worse. I'm only going to make that other person more on guard, right? So you just sort of, you know, you don't say, fine, stop the conversation. I don't want to listen to you anymore. It's just like, okay, let me, let me think about that. You, you mentioned some stuff that I hadn't thought about before. So I'll think about that. Let's meet again in an hour or tomorrow or something like that, right? People are reasonable about that. They're not going to say, no, we must solve this now most of the time, right? Uh, like you, someone would have to be really, really angry or afraid or something like that to be in that position already. So you get some space. You go back, you think about the other person's point of view, you think about your point of view, you try to come up with yes and solutions, right? 50% of the time when I do this, the other person comes back to me and says, you know what, I've been thinking about it and you're right, let's do it your way. And the other 50% of the time, I come back with a solution that I'm, I'm, I like because I've had time to create one and that they like, right? Or that they like with a few little modifications that usually end up making it better or, or just different in a way that that person will be excited about. So the trick is it's okay <laughs> if you make something bad, you'll still get to do it again. Uh, when I was worried you know, that if, if I ever worked on a bad game, no one would want to hire me. And Spyborgs proved to me that wasn't the case, right? Spyborgs ended up with a 68, which actually isn't that bad. Uh, but I think maybe 2,000 people total ever bought that game, right? Oof, gut punch. I thought, why would anyone hire me after that? Well, <laughs> people did, and people continue to, right? Because they realize it's not one person's fault when a game made by several hundred people or a feature that's made by a lot of people doesn't work out. It really just isn't, right? You may get, you may get it mentioned in your review. You may have consequences for it, but it's not going to keep you from ever having to do it again. And that made me a lot less scared because when something I wanted to do wouldn't go well, which does happen, by the way, all the time, uh, and no matter how good you get, it's still going to happen, right? It just might happen a little bit less. Uh, but when, when it does happen, and you, 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 and it's done, not having, not, not, not being afraid that it's going to completely ruin you gives you enough mental and emotional room to say, you know what, you're right. That didn't work out. Let's talk about how to fix it right? And people want to work with people like that. They, what they don't want, what gets you in trouble, what gets you fired, what gets you not wanting, uh, what gets other people not wanting to give you more jobs is when you become a person who's hard to work with, right? Someone who argues over everything, someone who wants it their way or the highway, someone who is not a teammate. Do you see? They're, 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 they're not trying to come to a consensus or a, uh, a synthesis even, right? Those people are the people I see who don't get work. Those are the people who receive the strong consequences. And it's not just, I'm standing up for my work and people don't like it when I stand up for my work. No, it's, it's that you can stand up for your work in a way that doesn't piss people off and instead of making you enemies, makes you friends, right? Friends who are more likely to give on things. Uh, and they are probably just as much invested in that feature and just as much worried about it being the end of their career as I am or as you are, right? So in the end, what I came to is that it's not 
me versus this person or us versus them design versus programming or anything like that everybody is trying to make a good game or they wouldn't be doing it right so i've had to to learn to to ease off a little bit to accept other points of view to to say yes to people's ideas and then okay how can we together deal with this problem now right nobody gets pissed at that that's not it's not antagonistic it's not but it's also not weak it's not pacifistic passive Pacif pacifistic i don't know it's not letting people walk all over you right because you know what's important i mean you you should at least right you're the designer so what's important about my giant teddy bear feature is that it provides uh, the player with questions in combat that deal with, uh, I don't know, the, the weapon that teddy bears are vulnerable to, say, right? So if your solution deals with that, I'm good, right? For two reasons, which I mentioned before. A, solves my problem. B, gets you excited, right? So just, uh, I... I know to some people it does sound like you're giving too much, but when you do it in practice, you'll see that that actually isn't the case, that what you're doing is working together and not against. So uh, I know the original question wasn't necessarily about antagonistic working relationships, but it is something that happens a lot. So I thought perhaps I'd also explore that side of the question with the time I had left. Um, so let me let me just check real quick and see if any new questions came in while I was rambling. Okay, no new questions, so that means we're done. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, next week, no, next month, we're going to have two again. Uh, the first one is going to be the second Saturday of the month, and the, the, the last one will be on the last Saturday of the month. So uh, I'll be sending invitations for those, just sort of keep that in mind. Uh, I have the podcast recorded. Uh, my guest this month is, is my friend Mark Stewart. We worked on Spyborgs together, and now he works at Insomniac Games. I'm going to be editing that tonight, so that'll either come out tonight or tomorrow. Uh, but that'll be the October podcast. And then the, uh, the article, the, the second article for the month of October will be coming tonight, uh, hopefully. Uh, I got a little sick yesterday. I was hoping that I'd be able to do it last night, uh, but I got behind. So it'll either be just like the podcast tonight or on the first. Uh, so happy Halloween, everybody. I did say that I would, uh, I would come either with a costume or a prop. Well, I do have a prop. I have my sonic screwdriver, which is his, his sonic screwdriver. <laughs> So prop, I didn't lie, but you know, I also didn't, uh, you know, buy a costume, so I can't be wearing one. Sorry, guys. So uh, until next time, have a good thing. I don't know. What's the interval? Have a good couple weeks till I see you next time.